Welcome here to the PCR studio in Frankfurt um, for the session entitled New Horizons in Tricuspid Therapy, the Triactive Solution, a session that is sponsored by Orbus and Niche. My name is Michael Haude, and my great pleasure is to facilitate this session. We would like to have that as interactive as possible, so feel free to send in your questions via the chat option. We do have a chat master, Katarina Kiss, who is going to take care of that as well. So if we address this topic, we have to appreciate that uh, the significant tricuspid regurgitation is a frequent disease but it's rarely diagnosed. We know that, for example, in the US, it is affecting about 1.6 million people. How can we address that? Surgery is at least a theoretical option, but it is associated with a high mortality of around 9%. Therefore, multiple transcatheter devices have been developed to address the tricuspid regurgitation in high-risk patients. And according to their mode of action, you can differentiate them into direct suture annuloplasty devices, devices that uh, do a direct ring annuloplasty, those that do a coaptation enhancement, and then, of course, the option of performing a valve replacement. Now, having said this, this is a new technology, the so-called trick valve bicable system a catheter-based system uh, consisting of two self-expanding biological valves which are implanted in the superior and inferior vena cava in order to treat patients with hemodynamically relevant tricuspid regurgitation and caval reflux. So the objectives of that session are to learn about this new generation of bicaval valve implants for the treatment of tricuspid regurgitation and right heart disease to understand how this new generation of tricuspid valve system can contribute to patient's prognosis and can decrease procedural time, and third, to obtain first insights from a real-life case scenario. With having said that, this is the flow of the session. We're going to receive an introduction to the technology by Professor Katharina Kiss from Vienna. And then we're going to see a live taped case being performed in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, by the colleagues Faithful Azmi and Ahmad Santos. And then we have the opportunity to discuss that technology and the case together with the operators who are remotely connected. And then I'm going to be happy to make a final conclusion and take home message. So with having said that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Katarina Kiss, who will give us an introduction to the valve technology. Hi, thank you very much, Michael, Professor Howard, for this very kind introduction. I think it's a very exciting topic we're discussing today, and I'm very happy to present um, the technical details as well as some preliminary data of the trick valve today. These are my disclosures. As you are aware, the trick valve consists of two B carval uh, valves that will be implanted in the inferior and superior vena cava. It's the only dedicated system of uh, self expanding valves for B carval implantation. And as you can appreciate here, the valves have two completely different designs. You have on the left hand side the double funnel concept with a short skirt, which is dedicated for the inferior vena cava. Uh, the short skirt shall prevent paravalvular leakage, but of course also obstruction of the hepatic vein inflow. If we look at the design of the superior vena cava valve, you can appreciate the crown that will be anchored in the confluence of the brachiocephalica and the belly that will give additional anchorage in the superior vena cava. Both valves are self-expandable and come with bovine pericardium. Um, Due to the self-expanding character and the different sizes available, it is possible to cover most of the um, anatomies. It's a system of two self-expanding valves, which is dedicated for patients with hemodynamically relevant tricuspid insufficiency and carval reflux. This is very important during the screening process. Um, the prothesis are implanted percutaneously via the femoral vein. And of course, they're intended for patients at high risk. What is very important is that all of those valves come 
with a proprietary dry pericardium technology, which means that they are pre-mounted, which of course saves a lot of preparation time. The handling of the valves is much easier. And we can also see that safety is improved and also durability. If we look at the results of the preclinical testings, then the calcium content is significantly lower in this um, specially prepared pericardium. We have a decrease in thickness and an increase in tensile resistance. And I think it's very reassuring to see that even after 200 million cycles of hydrodynamic testings, the valve leaflets are completely intact. So it's very important that these valves come pre-mounted. They have a special anti-calcification treatment. They are free of preservation solution and therefore have a higher durability and easier and faster handling. I would like to talk you through some of the clinical data in a very short manner. And this is, um, first we have a special access program also called Compassionate Use Program, which we have conducted around the world due to the fact that there's no treatment alternative for many of the patients. The TRICOS-1 study was done in Lithuania following a special protocol and enrollment has been finalized more than a year ago. And TRICOS Euro study has been finalized also with the centers in Spain and Austria enrolled in 35 patients. And I'm more than, more than happy to say that we are expecting CE mark within the month of May. On behalf of the TRICOS and TRICOS Euro investigators, I would like to present some of the data. These are the baseline characteristics. And here I think it's no surprise we have a lot of patients with renal insufficiency. But what I would like to point out is that more than half of the patients in both of the clinical trials did have prior valve surgery. And this is a patient cohort that we will meet throughout the trials. If we look at the results, it's very important to point out that the patients have done all, have been done all with local anesthesia and transthoracic echoes, so it is feasible without full sedation. And we had zero in hospital mortality in both the clinical trials no stroke or TIA. We had one migration in the early feasibility trial, um, which led to surgical correction and one migration where the valve was completely stable. Otherwise, we have a very, very low um, uh, adverse event profile, which I think is important in this very sick patient cohort. If we look at the new health status, of course, those patients are severely ill, but we could show that we could reduce the new health class significantly in this patient cohort. This is also true for six minute walk test and cancer questionnaire. Here we have to remember that most of those follow up visits were performed during the uh, lockdown and there was a very uh, strict stay home strategy, both in Spain and also in Austria. What is very important is the remodeling of the right ventricle, which uh, is reassuring as we ventricalize the right atrium and we're not really sure in the beginning about the consequences. And this is a very nice example of a CT follow-up of a patient, which showed that we have a up to 50% reduction of the right ventricular volumes. So in conclusion, TRICOV is a new promising and less invasive concept for the treatment of TR. The successful and uneventful initial experience showed the feasibility of applying this new therapy in patients with severe TR. TRICOV was associated with significant improvement in functional status, quality of life, and hemodynamic at six month follow up. And the confirmation of these results will, of course, need a larger number of patients, which we hope to acquire after CE mark. Uh, and the longer follow up may open also a new avenue for the treatment of TR. Thank you very much. And I would like to hand over to our colleagues in Malaysia. So thank you very much, Katerina. It's now time to see a live recorded case uh, being done in the National Heart Institute in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, introduce. My name is Dr. Azmi from the National Heart Institute uh, of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. With me, uh, I have Dr. Shaiful Azmi, uh, who is our interventional cardiologist, and also Dr. Jaya Kantan as well, who is our interventional cardiologist, joining me. Uh, to perform this uh, first procedure, trig valve, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia. So um, the, what we're going to do next is we're going to present the case by Dr. Jeremy Kwa, uh, and uh, the case will be presented to look at the background of the patients as well. Okay. Good day, everyone. My name is Dr. Jeremy, and it's a privilege to present this case on trig valve. The operators today would be Dr. Azmi, Dr. Shaifu, and Dr. Jaya, and we'll be presenting the case 
from National Heart Institute, IJN, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. We do not have any potential conflict of interest to report. Background of the patient, she's a 67 years old Malay lady, underlying chronic hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and dyslipidemia. She was referred to our center for echocardiographic finding of severe TR with moderate pulmonary hypertension. Her weight was 56.4 kg, height of 162 centimeters, and BMI of 21.53 kg per meter squared, body surface area of 1.59 meters squared. Functional class, she was at NYHA class 3. Six mini walk test was reduced at 360 meters. Blood pressure was 154 over 100 millimeter mercury. Heart rate was 90 to 100 in atrial fibrillation. Clinically, she had systolic murmur grade 3 out of 6 at right lower sternal age, mild hepatomegaly at 2 cm with bilateral ankle edema. Lab test results, her anti-proBNP was significantly raised at 3,509 picogram per meal, increasing trend from 2,042 picogram meals in 2018, and this was in the past 3 years. EGFR of now is 52 meals per minute, categorizing her as CKD stage 3A. The rest of her Lab results were unremarkable. ECG showing AF at 93 beats per minute. Now her list of medications. She was on tab Debigatron, Bisoprolol, Perindopril, Spironolactone, and Simvastatin. So she was most on the uh, guideline directed medical therapy. And this is her echo results, latest echo results. Right ventricular inflow tract view showing poor cooptation of the tricuspid valve leaflets with a TV analysis of 4.6 centimeters, so that's increased, showing severe functional TR. Her tricuspid valve morphology was normal. This is the apical four-chamber view, showing a significantly drop of her LV EF from 60% to 38%, and malfunctional MR. Her chambers were dilated, with significantly dilated RA, with a volume of 103 mL per meter squared. Her TAP-C were also significantly reduced from 2.1 cm to 1.5 cm, and the RVFAC was 36%, so she had fairly satisfactory right ventricular function. This is a subcostal view showing plutoric IVC, estimated PAP of 58 mm mercury by echo Doppler. There was clearly seen hepatic vein systolic flow reversal. Now, her further workup, CTP in 2018 showed no pulmonary artery thromboembolism and normal lung with no interstitial lung disease. Coronary angiogram done recently showed moderate coronary artery disease. Now, her right heart catheterization results, the numbers highlighted in red show an increased readings, while the numbers highlighted in green show reduced readings. The SVC, IVC, and RA pressure showed respectively 25, 24, and 23 millimeter mercury. Her PAP, Systolic, 46, diastolic, 29, and mean of 33 mm mercury. Her PCWP was 18 mm mercury. Cardiac output and cardiac index, respectively, was 2.5 and 1.6. The TPG was 15 mm mercury, and PVR was 3.51 Woods unit. Our diagnosis for her was severe functional tricuspid regurgitation, secondary to chronic AF, AFTR NTT. So we counseled her, and patient, was, patient and family were not keen for surgery and they agreed upon the strict valve solution. The CT angiogram was done as per protocol before the procedure, showing the um, fairly straightforward SVC and IVC. And the size chosen was 25 for the SVC and 31 for the IVC. So that's all for my presentation. I'll pass over to my uh, uh, consultant, Dr. Asmi, for the further presentation. Thank you. we have two femoral vein access. So the first one is we have the right femoral vein uh, that we put in for the introduction of the, uh, of the uh, device. Uh, so currently we have a 22 French sheath inserted. Uh, and uh, of course that will allow in the 27 uh, French in device to be put in. So in the left femoral, currently what we have is uh, we have two sheath in. Uh, one is a pigtail that goes into the SVC currently position. Uh, to look at the position of the SVC uh, and of course in terms of the uh, anatomy of the origin of the innominate vein. Uh, we also have a, a second uh, sheath as well that we put in, uh, that we put in an, um, a multi-purpose catheter into the pulmonary uh, artery uh, for position. So this is what we have 
currently. Okay, all right, very true. Yeah, we're going in to. Bawaski? Can we fluoro? Stop. Center, please. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So here we have the swang and reference that will be uh, where the mid part of the device will be. So we, we call the belly of the device. Capture that. So, Capture. and the valve is receivable, but normally we start a little bit higher okay. than the intended final position. And we when we start opening, we can start the deployment. So here we see what I mentioned before, Capture. the nose cone, is uh, is farther from the device. This is why we need a good position of the wire in the jugular vein. Yeah, okay. to have enough space to advance it. Okay. Okay. This seems very good to me. IBC. Okay. So we we can see the bifurcation is very high and we are still a little bit low but we have uh, much space in this case yeah so i i would not go farther in this okay. patient okay all right okay which means that we can't implant there should we put back the pigtail <laughs> for the moment i think you can keep it there until the valve is a little bit open perfect you are doing it perfect all right yes the, the the speed of turning is now. Maybe you can check with Anjo if you like uh, okay. your position and you can pull down a little bit your pigtail afterwards. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we can see very well uh, the right atrium and we are at a very good height. So I think you can continue and you can pull down the to the uh, to the right atrium the pig till now because uh, I think we will not need any more angels. Okay. Capture that. No, so I'm Sini. Okay. All right. Yeah. Ta ta ta. Sini, Sini. Oh, tadi Sini. Oh. Sini. Okay, me. Okay. All right. Should I Sini? Yeah, it went up a bit. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Hold it tight down. Perfect. To the veins of the patient. Okay, keep the tension down perfectly, perfectly. Yeah. To the delivery system. It's very, it's important to release one by one. So just turn the knob, stop a little bit, okay. turn the knob again when the second hook is released and so on. Okay. Right. That's one. First hook, so we can stop, uh, unblock the knob a little bit, wait a, a few seconds. Okay. Second hook seems to have been already released. Yeah. And I think there is a still one. All right. I can feel something. Ah. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Very good. Very good. That was perfect. Feel a bit <laughs> Capture it. Okay, great. So now we can see in T the, the valve already deployed, but the leaflets are a little bit high. Sometimes we cannot see them okay. in the T. Yeah. Okay. But we could check if there is any uh, paravalvular leak. Okay. There, are there are two ways to perform the receipt of the delivery system. Okay. First one is by turning the knob uh, all the other way. This one. I Second one is to is down. to unlock the delivery the, the 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 knob. Sorry, and recapture it manually. Okay. Okay. That yeah. was perfect. <laughs> so yeah. do I? Uh, this one we push okay. under floor, please. Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. It's, it's better if you are a little bit more. Um, so you see that the catheter is advancing towards the nose cone. Yeah. Yeah. And go all, all the way, all the way. Uh, but it's going down. Ah. 
Yes, because remember, we don't see the tip of so you, the, you this distance okay. is the same. You are just pulling back okay. everything, okay. but yeah. the catheter itself uh, went into the nose cone. And now you can lock again. Okay. Okay. We will uh, wait for the IVC device. So we see in this image, we can see very well, uh, just above the hepatic veins, uh, there, there is like something that remembers me, the Marshall uh, ligament, which will be our landing on for the for the valve and in the other side in the uh, what is the left side of the patient uh, there is the other side of the landing zone that we will need to control also by t okay okay when the valve is already opened okay you want to wire back yeah so the angulation is important for the deployment you can see that the, the the vein is not going straight into the right atrium, but with a little bit of angulation of bending. That's important because the, the valve uh, will be straight, which means that one of the sides might be a little bit more into the atrium while deploying. Okay. And when we will when we will release finally the valve, this will just jump a little bit to adapt to the anatomy of the patient. Yeah, the risk of that is if you go too much uh, into the hepatic veins, you can go too far into there and the valve may open into the hepatic vein. Oh, oh. oh. Yes, I think you will need to reposition a little bit your pig. Okay, we have reposition. Is that okay? So I put... I would not go very far up. I think we are in a good position now, a, a bit limit, but the valve will tend to go up a little bit in the, st in the initial first uh, deployment. And also remember that in the left side of the patient, the landing zone is a little bit lower. If, if we see again the angel, so I think it's a good position to start opening. Okay. 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 And now, uh, the, the upper part of the vertebra is a very good reference for you okay. to hold the position while the release is ongoing. Right. Okay, that, that is perfect. And in the other side, look, you are very, very uh, limited. So just do not pull down more from here. Just keep the position. Okay. Are you, are you opening? Yes, I'm opening. Okay, perfect. I can see you. Okay. 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 That is very good, very gentle. So also this time is very important to allow the nitinol to expand so that there is not much pressure when when the valve is finally deployed. So now we are reaching the point yeah. where the valve uh, can be receivable. Yeah. So we have to check if we are happy, if okay, if we yeah, pull yeah. down too much and we went into the hepatic veins, this is the point to recapture, but it seems by Angel, uh, like the hepatic side is perfectly positioned. We can see also very nicely the TE, just about 10, 9, 10 millimeters to the atrium. Cuse the image a little bit so we can see perfectly the, the lower part of the Yes, now, now it's a good moment to remove the big deal if you want. Okay, okay. I, I can't do that. Okay. Okay, I got it. Okay. Just pull it. All right. Great. Okay. You're maintaining very nicely the position of the valve. That is perfect. Okay, I'm turning and stopping. Turning and stopping. That is perfect. Now we can see how the valve moves more with the veins, so it's starting to, to adapt to the, to the anatomy. Okay, okay that's one. Okay, that just stop there. That was perfect. So now, Dr. Asmi, uh, I think you can, Yes, release a little bit the tension of all the system. The second hook is releasing now. Okay. So you see the, the vein is smaller in the lower part. Yep. 
this, uh, but the bulb is larger in the lower part. So this is why we need to give it time to adapt. Okay, very well. We saw very nicely how the second hook was released. Continue. Yes, you can continue. Are you pulling down uh, the system or just, just just relax? Leave it now. Okay. Yes, leave, leave the tension. Don't don't have too much tension so that okay. And just continue turning. So now the valve, you see how it has bent it? Yeah. Because as we were discussing, the anatomy is this way. The, the, this is how the veins enter the into the patient. It moved a, a little bit up, but we have uh, positioned it very low. So I think we are good uh, according to the echo images. So we are. See any paravalvular leak? Okay. Which was the, the greater concern, uh, but it's okay. We see a minimal central leak because we still have the stiff wire through the leaflets. So when we remove the wire, we will be able to measure that better. Uh, the V wave is about uh, 17. 17 to 18. Mm -hmm. So I think since we are under uh, general anesthesia, the V wave is not so high. Yeah. We can see it's very similar in this case. That's right, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, very good. We see the co-optation of the leaflets is, is good. Then we see some color there. There is a minor central leak. But mostly this will um, diminish uh, once the leaflets have adapted and the valve is fully mm -hmm. um, adapted to the venous structure. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you very much, Dr. Amar Santos. Thank, thank you. you very much, thank Katrina. You. Thank you so much, congratulations. Congratulations to the first case in Malaysia and that part of Asia outside China. Fantastic. Congratulations. So I think this was a great presentation and uh, showing how that technology works. As was said, it was the first uh, implant being performed in Malaysia. It was remotely due to the uh, COVID pandemic followed by uh, Dr. Ahmad Santos from Valladolid, who, is, who has the largest experience with this kind of technology. Before we move now into the discussion, actually, I would like to make a statement that this technology received uh, CE marking as of last week, which is, I think, a big step forward. Now I invite our discussants, which is Dr. Ahmad Santos from Valladolid in Spain, and then three members of the team from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, Drs. Azmi, Dr. Rosli, and uh, Dr. Shaiful, whom you have seen during the procedure. Um, we received numerous of questions from our attendants and audience, so I will try to address them as good as possible. I would like to start with a first one to Dr. Rosli. Dr. Rosli, can you, can you just tell us uh, about this concept of putting two valves into the uh, superior and inferior vena cava and how that to address the TR, so go, going away from the treatment of the disease itself, and how does that fit into the whole available armamentarium to treat uh, severe TR? Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, so this is a novel uh, and interesting device because when you place the valves in the IVC and SVC, you actually prevent the backflow of blood from the RA. And what happens is that uh, you, you just have to ex see it as the RA being an, as an extension of the RV. So over time, the RV can readapt. It, uh, the RA assumes the flow or the volume of blood from the uh, uh, RV and over time, the RV readapts by because of the reduction in volume and pressure and stress on the RV. The RV can actually become smaller, and you can actually see the uh, coaptation gap that causes the TR becoming smaller. And all of these have a positive effect on the patients. The congestion is reduced, and you have improvement in terms of symptoms and New York heart association, 
And the potential is that it minimizes the risk of right heart failure. So all these are very interesting. Thank you, Rosalie. Dr. Ahmad Santos, can you in particular emphasize a little bit more on the two different valve components of the system? Are these valves exactly the same? Is the configuration exactly the same? I think we need to unmute you. Excuse me. Thank you. Yes, the, the, I was mentioning that the delivery system is the same, which means that it's important to prepare the one by one, not to confound the superior and inferior valves, because each device is afterwards different. So both the superior and inferior Benacaba valves are made from nitinol and with bobine pericardium in the leaflets and also in the ceiling skirt. But the superior vena cava is smaller, normally more tapered, with a high bifurcation with the nominate, and we need this design with a central belly and a ceiling in the lower part, while the skirt, the ceiling in the inferior vena cava valve has to be superior uh, to avoid uh, some leak toward the hepatic veins around the valve. So the design is clearly different. Uh, the, the, The one for the inferior vena cava is tapered, like larger in the lower part and smaller in the upper part, which is the way it anchors in the inferior vena cava. But of course, uh, the idea is the same to prevent backflow to both veins. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rosley, um, is, is the trick valve uh, bicaval system suitable for functional TR patients that have large or even super large coaptation gaps at very dilated annulus? that comes from our audience, the question. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the large or big challenges of treating tricuspid valve is because of the large annulus and the large coaptation gap. And this makes uh, it very difficult to treat whatever device that you have currently available. So the fact that uh, the bicable valve is a valve that is heterotopic device, means say that it doesn't involve the leaflet or annulus at all, so it is suitable for patients with large, uh, you know, coaptation gap and also dilated endless because you don't really have to treat this, uh, these areas and these are the sites which are posing a big challenge. Thank you. Another question to you, uh, which we received several times from our audience is, um, can you treat with this technology patients who do have a pacemaker or defibrillator lead uh, in their superior vena cava? Yes. Um, once again, this is a device that doesn't really involve the uh, analysis or leaflet itself. So it is just, uh, we call it a heterotopic uh, device. And uh, with uh, that, uh, it has been shown that in a number of patients, whereby they have actually implanted these devices in patients who have pacemakers, and that has not affected the function of the pacemakers. Yes, it can be done. It can, it can be done. And is it, is it more difficult to fix the device if the pacemaker lead or defibrillator lead is there, or doesn't it really make, make any kind of matter? As far as I can understand, uh, it doesn't really matter because what is important is that the placement of the device, uh, and this is a self-expandable device, so the pressure onto the uh, um, external structures are not going to be as huge as when you put in a balloon expandable device. So this is uh, something which is reassuring. Okay. Other question that, that comes up uh, is uh, to Dr. Azmi. Um, what is the peri, uh, peri and post-procedural antithrombotic regimen in these patients? What do you, what do you yeah. need to have to follow? Yeah. Hi, Professor. So I think during the uh, peri procedure or during the procedure, uh, once we have um, established the femoral venous excess, Uh, we will immediately anticoagulate the patients with intravenous heparin. So that's to begin with. And this heparin will continue, um, you know, based on their ECT throughout the procedure. And post-procedure, we will continue or we will start the patient an oral anticoagulation. And this has to be lifelong. So uh, this is a, a standard for patients with trick valve. And is, is it recommended to go for cumidine or warfarin, or yeah. can you use NOAX as well, or are you yeah. brave enough to use them so, already? Yeah, so for, for example, this patient who, is, uh, who had this procedure, our patient, he has, uh, she has atrial fibrillation, and what we did was we continue on warfarin to begin with for a year, and then after that, we will, you know, it is safe for them to change into, into NOAC, uh, which what she was on before. Thank you. 
Dr. Ahmad Santos, um, the, the question that popped up several times is, do we really need to treat both the superior and inferior vena cava with two uh, separate valves, or wouldn't be enough just to treat one of them, usually the inferior one? So technically, it's possible to treat just one, but it's not a good idea, because here the concept is to fully avoid the backflow. Avoiding the backflow, we will ventricularize the atrium, and then there will be this remodeling that we have seen in the CT core lab analysis, reducing the volumes of the right chambers. If there is backflow because you only implant one valve, then you will not uh, proceed with this uh, uh, improvement in the dimensions and pressures in the right chambers. So it's important to implant bones. But I have to mention that recently we did the first case with trick valve in that. We have several, several other questions that need to be addressed. One, we have seen the case that was performed in a hybrid operating room. And the question is, can you do that procedure under local anesthesia or conscious sedation, or do you need to have a um, general anesthesia? Potentially try to answer, answer this question. Um, as long as I do know, and I've seen the procedure, we are on the venous side, we, we need to have large um, or access to the veins, which we are used to do. So uh, using a extensive local anesthesia or using a conscious sedation potentially is, is good enough to do that as long as the patient can stay calmly on the table. So the, the, the other question that was going to pop up here and now I try to, to answer with the knowledge that I do have with that technology since our colleagues uh, dropped out of the Zoom conference is what landmarks do we use in order to implant that? And uh, it is quite important to understand that for the superior vena cava, as has been shown there, the landmarks will be the enominate on the one side, the jugular vein on the other side, and the pulmonary artery with this crossing in the catheter in there on the other side. So um, that these landmarks are important to, to achieve. Um, the part in the superior vena cava should be implanted as high as possible. And the belly, we have seen the belly, the, the part that is in the uh, superior vena cava has that belly, uh, should be above the pulmonary artery. So I think this is important. This is why you need to identify these anatomical structures in order to have the correct implantation. Um, Vice versa, what are the landmarks that we have for the implantation of the part in the inferior vena cava? Um, has been shown in the case as well, but re-emphasizing, um, it is the suprahepatic vein, the right atrial junction, and the diaphragm. You identify that echo-wise in the TEE and thereby find your, your landing zone there. Um, again, here, in the part in the IVC should be implanted as deep as possible with a minimal crown protrusion that is uh, possible in the right atrium. So what else of questions do we receive? Um, do we need to post-dilate the stent after implantation? You have seen this is a self-expanding stent. So uh, usually, and we are here in the vein, so usually we, we don't have to do that. Um, I don't think that you can achieve more by post-dilating that very much. But uh, honestly speaking, um, if there would be a need, it would be something that could, could be tried. Honestly, that potentially Dr. Ahmad Santos has to answer, who has the largest experience uh, with that. So um, other question? If we implant uh, the two cables, the superior and the inferior one, won't this increase the pressure in the right atrium? Okay, so we, we get back our colleagues. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, this, this question then I would like to address to you again, because again, I mentioned it, you have the largest experience with that device. The question was, um, what is happening once you put in the two valves in the superior and inferior vena cava? Uh, does that increase the pressure in the right atrium, and what does it mean for the right atrium and the pressure over there? So then I can try to give that, give that answer. 
Um, of course, it, 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 yes, it happens right after the procedure. Um, since then, you have a certain kind of ventricularization of the right, right atrium. However, it, it is going to adapt to that, and the right ventricle also readapts to that. I think this is important to emphasize and to understand. And that during follow-up that was observed, there is a reduction of the volume in the right atrium and the right ventricle, as was documented in the treated patients by a CT scan. Um, there is also a reduction in the pressure of the right atrium then observed, and I think this is the adaptive process that is then going to happen once you have the new valves in there. So, uh, let's see. I see I more and more people coming back. I try to, I try to answer the questions as good as possible, and um, maybe, maybe I can, I can um, finalize, because we already had quite a lot of time done, for, for Dr. Azmi, which criteria, or is there a, a, a significant criterion where you cannot use the trick valve system? Yeah, okay. I think this is a very good question because I think the selection of patient is very, very important for this device. As you know, that there is a lot of disadvantage and advantage for this device. So technically what we try to do is we try to exclude patients with severe LV dysfunction. So we use a cut line of uh, a cutoff of a LVF of less than 30%. And of course, in patients with severe RV dysfunctions as well, I think you know, we need to exclude these type of patients. And uh, you know, what we normally measure is TEPC on echocardiogram. And the measurement that we, you know, we use is based on uh, the guidelines and the study, which is a TEPC of less than 13 millimeters. So these are the ones that we exclude. And there are other um, patients that we exclude includes patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. So with a systolic pulmonary artery of more than 65 millimeter mercury. And the reason why we do this is actually we want to try and avoid acute RV failure uh, soon after the procedure. So these are you know, three very, very important parameters that we need to know before we include them for, for trick valve treatment. Thank and of you. course, you know, the last one will be a congenital structural heart disease because the anatomy will be very different you know, in this group of patients. Thank you very much. I like to or need to sum up right now and uh, would like to come to the take home message. Uh, what we have seen and tried also to discuss with these, I'm sorry for that, uh, technical issues. But what we can state is that CAVI is feasible in advanced heart failure with tricuspid regurgitation, even with pacemaker leads in situ. CAVI is independent of annular size or tricuspid valve anatomy, as there is no interaction with the orthotopic valve. The trick valve system is the only medical device consisting of two pre-mounted dedicated valves for bicarval implantation in TR patients. And this system reduces cable backflow and therefore signs of right heart failure, such as peripheral edema, acetus, and hepatic congestion. And the trick valve implantation is safe and straightforward procedure as we nicely have seen in the live demonstration. With that, I would like to thank all the presenters and uh, those in the community and audience who send us their questions. And finally, I would like to thank Orbos Niche for supporting this symposium. And therefore, I would like to conclude and wish you a fruitful rest of the EuroPCR 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.